Welcome, everyone. I am Arthur McMahon, and this is the Better Hiker Podcast, where we explore the history of adventure, examining the experiences and philosophies of great adventure seekers so that we can apply what they learn to our own lives. In today's episode, we will be following Gertrude Bell on an archaeological journey from Jerusalem to the ruins of Petra, a once capital city in what is now southern Jordan, originally built sometime around 9000 BC, which is famous for its rock-cut architecture. You're probably most familiar with its portrayal in the third Indiana Jones movie, The Last Crusade. One of Petra's remaining rock-carved structures was used as the entrance to the temple which housed the Holy Grail. That belongs in a museum! So do you! Now, though those ruins can be quite interesting, we're going to focus on Gertrude Bell's story. She was an amazing and important historical figure from the not-so-distant past, who hasn't really left much of an impression in the history books, which is at no fault of her own. You're likely familiar with her British male contemporaries like Lawrence of Arabia and Winston Churchill, but Gertrude accomplished as much, if not more than those men in her lifetime, as a woman born in the 19th century. Gertrude Bell was a world traveler, an eloquent writer, a mountaineer, archaeologist, linguist, and she was a British political officer who fought for self-governing Middle Eastern states, and outlined the political boundaries of modern Iraq after World War I. Bell was born on July 14, 1868 in Durham, England, to a wealthy family. Her mother died when Gertrude was three, which led to a lifelong bond between Gertrude and her father, Sir Hugh Bell, which is displayed clearly in the volumes of letters she wrote to her father during her world travels. After receiving her early education from Queen's College in London, Bell went on to Oxford University, where she became the first woman to graduate with a first-class honors degree in modern history from the university. She was a privileged child. She was white, wealthy, and well-educated, but that didn't add up to all that much in her day, not for a woman in a man's world. She had to be headstrong. She had to fight with tooth and nail to go where she wanted, to be who she wanted to be, to pursue her interests. Bell left England soon after her education was complete, and when she returned home, it was never for long. During her years abroad, she traveled around the world multiple times, spending much of her time in the Middle East studying tribal relations, language, and the daily life of the people. She mastered the Arabic, Persian, French, and German languages, which propelled her into a career with British intelligence alongside her writing career. Remembered for her superior intellect, unrivaled enthusiasm, and thirst for adventure, Bell befriended many of the individuals she encountered in her travels, but she was also thought to be stubborn and unwavering in the face of adversity never allowing another to cross her without a fight. After her death, Bell's legacy continued through her publications and the lasting impression she left on everyone she met. Having not only played a strong role in placing King Faisal on the throne of Baghdad, she also established congenial relations with the King of Jordan. She has been described as one of the few representatives of His Majesty's government remembered by the Arabs with anything resembling affection. An obituary written by her peer D.G. Hogarth expressed the respect British officials held for her. Hogarth honored her by saying, No woman in recent time has combined her qualities, her taste for arduous and dangerous adventure with her scientific interest and knowledge, her competence in archaeology and art, her distinguished literary gift, her sympathy for all sorts and condition of men, her political insight and appreciation of human values, her masculine vigor, hard common sense, and practical efficiency all tempered by feminine charm and a most romantic spirit. In the letters of Gertrude Bell which were selected and edited by her stepmother, Lady Florence Bell, of which I am about to read a few of to you, Lady Bell says of Gertrude, Scholar, poet, historian, archaeologist, art critic, mountaineer, explorer, gardener, naturalist, distinguished servant of the state, Gertrude was all of these, and was recognized by experts as an expert in them all. Is that enough of an impression to leave you with? Now that you have an idea for what a remarkable person Gertrude was, we're going to listen to some of the letters she sent home to her father. In them you'll see her tenacity and warmth, her intelligence and admitted ignorance. Her curiosities carried her to lands which had been until then essentially off-limits to Western women. From Jerusalem January 1st, 1900. Will you send me out a wide gray felt sun hat to ride in, and put a black velvet ribbon around it with straight bows? My Syrian girl is charming and talks very prettily, but with a strong local accent. It adds enormously to one's difficulties that one has to learn a patois and a purer Arabic at the same time. 
I took her out for a long walk on Friday afternoon and went photographing about Jerusalem. She was much entertained, though she was no good as a guide, for she had never been to the Jewish quarter, though she had lived here all of her life. That's typical of them. I knew my way, however, as every Englishwoman would. It's as simple as possible. She came with us on the following day on a most delightful expedition. We started at nine this morning. It was Sunday, and therefore a legitimate holiday, and rode down to the Valley of Hinnon and along the Brook Kedron, which is dry at the season. Through a deep valley full of immensely old olive trees and rock tombs scarcely older, then up a long hill and down on the other side into a shallow naked valley, where there were many encampments of black Bedouin tents, and so into an extraordinary gorge called the Valley of Fire. The rock lies in natural terraces and is full of caves. The brook Kedron has cut the steepest, deepest cleft for its bed, and on either side rise these horizontal layers of stone. They have been a regular city of anchorites, each living in his cave and drawing his ladder up behind him when he went in. Half a mile or so further on lies a citadel of this cave town, the Monastery of Marsaba, itself half a cave and half building, its long walls and towers creeping up the steep rock, the dome of its chapel jutting out from it, and the irregular galleries and rows of cells hanging out over a precipice. The rock itself is full of little square windows, and these are called cave cells, and probably about as old as St. Saba, who lived here in the 6th century. Do you know I have been reading the story of Aladdin to myself for pleasure, without a dictionary? It is not very difficult, I must confess. Still, it's ordinary good Arabic, not for beginners, and I find it too charming for words. Moreover, I see that I really have learnt a good deal since I came, for I couldn't read just for fun to save my life. It is satisfactory, isn't it? I look forward to a time when I shall just read Arabic like that. And then for my histories, I really think that these months here will permanently add to the pleasure and interest of the rest of my days. Honest Injun. Still, there is a lot and a lot more to be done first. So, to work. February 28th, 1900. Sunday was too many for me. I did not go out at all but sat home and read Aladdin and looked at the steaming rain. Monday was a little better. Charlotte and I put on short skirts and thick boots and went for a long walk to a lovely spring she knew of. We walked down a deep valley which, as long as we have known, it has been dry as a bone, and where to our surprise we found a deep, swift stream. Ain Tolma, our object, was on the other side, and as there are no bridges in this country, there being no rivers as a rule, there was nothing for it but to take off our shoes and stockings and wade. The water came above our knees. The other side was too lovely. The banks of the river were carpeted with red anemones, a sheet of them, and to walk by the side of a rushing stream is an unrivaled experience in this country. When we got to Ain Tolma, we found the whole place covered with cyclamen and orchids and a white sort of garlic, very pretty, and the rocks out of which water comes were draped in a maiden hair. There were a lot of small boys, most amiable young gentlemen, who helped us to pick pink cyclamen, and when I explained that I had no money, they said that it was a bakshish to me, the flowers. We had a very scrambly walk back, waded the stream again, and when we got to the little village at the foot of the hill, we hired some small boys to carry our flowers home for us. In this village I lost my way and we found ourselves wandering over the flat roofs and jumping across the streets below. I hurried on, as it was five and I had a lesson at 5.30, with five little beggar boys in my train. They were great fun. We had long conversations all the way home. It was such an amusement to be able to understand. The differences of pronunciation are a little puzzling at first to the foreigner. There are two K's in Arabic. The town people drop the hard K altogether and replace it by a guttural for which we have no equivalent. The country people pronounce the hard K soft, and the soft K ch, but they say their gutturals beautifully, and use a lot of words which belong to a more classical Arabic. The Bedouins speak the best. They pronounce all their letters, and get all the subtlest shades of meanings out of the words. I must tell you this is a great day. A German post office has been opened, and we expect marvels from it. There is parcel post and all complete, and I advise you to put German post office on your letters to me. One of our kvasses has gone to be post office kvass, and as I passed down Jaffa Street, he rushed out open-armed to greet me and begged me to come in. So in I went, and retired behind the counter, and shook hands warmly with the two postmasters. They dined with us a few nights ago, and bought six stamps to celebrate the occasion, which I didn't pay for, as I had no money, the kvass saying all the time, Al-Katir Al, which means it is extremely high and is the superlative of admiration in Arabic. The tourists who were sending off telegrams were rather surprised to see somebody seemingly like themselves come in hand in hand 
with an old Arab and fall into the arms of officials behind the counter. It was extremely high. Today came the joyful news of the relief of Ladysmith. My horse is extremely well. We are going for a long ride tomorrow. The Hardings and I mean to go for ten days into the Moab about the 18th. It will be lovely. We shall take tents. Goodbye. From Ayan Musa, Tuesday, March 20th, 1900. From my tent. I left Jerusalem yesterday soon after nine, having seen my cook at seven and arranged that he should go off as soon as he could to get the mules ready. His name is Hannah. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But that H is such as you have never heard. I rode down to Jerusalem alone. The road was full of tourists. Caravans of donkeys carrying tents for cooks and Bedouin escorts. I made friends as I went along, and rode first with one Bedouin and then another, all of them exaggerating the dangers I was about to run with the hope of being taken with me into the Moab. Halfway down I met my guide from Salt, east of Jordan, coming up to meet me. His name is Tarif. He is a servant of the clergyman of Salt, and a Christian therefore, and a perfect dear. We rode along together some time, but he was on a tired horse, so I left him to come on slowly and hurry down to Jericho where I arrived with the Bedouin, famished. I went to the Jordan Hotel. We then proceeded to the Mudirs, for I wanted to find out the truth of the tales I had been told about the Moab, but he was out. By this time Tarif and Hannah had arrived, and reported the tents to be one and a half hours behind, which seemed to make camping at the Jordan impossible that night. I determined to pass the night at Jericho and make an early start. This morning I got up at five and at six was all ready, having sent on my mules and Hannah to the Jordan Bridge. The river valley is wider on the other side and was full of tamarisks in a full white flower and willows in the newest leaf. There were almost no slime pits, and the gore plain wilderness had blossomed like the rose. It was the most unforgettable sight, sheets and sheets of varied and exquisite color, purple, white, yellow, and the brightest blue and fields of scarlet ranunculus. Nine-tenths of them I didn't know, but there was the yellow daisy, the sweet-scented mauve wild stock a great splendid sort of dark purple onion, the white garlic and purple mallow, and higher up a tiny blue iris and red anemones and a dawning pink thing like a linium. We were now joined by a cheerful couple from Bethlehem, a portly fair man in white with a yellow kefia. That's the thing they wear around their heads bound by ropes of camel hair and falling over their shoulders. And a fair beard, riding a very small donkey, and a thinner, darker man walking. The first one looked like a portly burger. He asked me if I were a Christian and said I was. Praise be to God. I replied piously that it was from God. So we all journeyed on together through the wilderness of flowers and every now and then the silent but amiable Ishmael got off to pick me a new variant of plant, while the others enlivened the way by stalking wood pigeons. But the pigeons were far too wily, and they let off their breech loaders in vain and stood waist deep in flowers watching the birds flying cheerfully away with a may their house be destroyed from my Christian friend. A little higher up, we came to great patches of corn sown by the Adwin Bedouins. Now we saw a group of black tents far away on a little hill covered with white tombs, and here the barley was in ear, and, in the midst of great stretches of it, little watchtowers of branches had been built, and a man stood on each to drive away birds and people. One was playing a pipe as we passed. It was much more Arcadian than Arcadia. We had now reached the bottom of the foothills, and leaving the gore plain behind us, we began to mount. We crossed a stream flowing down the weighty Hispan at a place called Aque. It was so wet here that we rode on to a place where there were a few thorn trees, peopled by immense crowds of resting birds. They seize on any little bush, for there are so few, and the Arabs come and burn the bush and catch and cook all the birds in one. On the top of the first shoulder we came to spreading cornfields. The plan is this. The Arabs sow one place this year, and go and live somewhere else lest their animals should eat the growing corn. Next year, this lies fallow and the fallow of the year before is sown. Over the second shoulder, we got onto a stretch of rolling hills, and we descended the valley to Ayan Musa, a collection of beautiful springs with an Arab camp pitched above them. I found the loveliest iris I have ever yet seen, big and sweet-scented and so dark purple that the hanging down petals are almost black. It decorates my tent now. Half an hour later, my camp was pitched a little lower down in a lovely grassy plateau. We were soon surrounded by Arabs who sold us hen and some excellent sour milk, Laban, it is called. While we bargained, the women and children wandered round and ate grass, just like goats. The women are unveiled. They wear a blue cotton gown six yards long, which is gathered up and bound round their heads and their waists and falls to their feet. Their faces, from the mouth downwards, are tattooed with indigo, and their hair hangs down in two long plates on either side. 
Our horses and mules were hobbled and groomed. Hannah brought me an excellent cup of tea, and at six a good dinner consisting of soup made of rice and olive oil, very good, and an Irish stew and raisins from salt, an offering from Tarif. My camp lies just under Pisgah. Isn't it a joke to be able to talk Arabic? We saw a great flock of storks today, the father of luck, Tarif calls them, and an eagle. I am now amongst the Bilka Arabs, but these particular people are the Ghanimat, which Hannah explains as father of flocks. Breakity break, breakity break. This young Gertrude is full of confidence, so sure that the dangers are exaggerated, and that everyone she crosses is wanting and willing to chat with her. She's about 30 years old at this time, and just beginning to learn Arabic, a language she would soon master. Her courage propels her forward into discussion and discourse with the women, men, and children she encounters, despite her as-of-yet unskilled attempts at speaking Arabic and grasping its different dialects. Some of the descriptions she writes to her father of the people she encounters are outdated, but don't mistake them for racism or purposeful ignorance. She's a product of her time. The foreign world was just that, foreign, unexplored. Back then, the average English person had little sense of modern political correctness while they were abroad. The British government was still colonizing what they would call untamed lands and people. Proper knowledge and terminology just didn't exist yet. We're still figuring out some of that today. Gertrude's appreciation and respect for different people and cultures shows through in her letters, and it's a character-divining trait that shines across all of her legacy. You'll get a better sense of it in the readings ahead. It's one of the most interesting aspects of Gertrude, I think. As an archaeologist, she's more interested in people and culture, both present and past, than she is in the beauty of the natural world she's traveling through. She does appreciate nature, don't get me wrong, but it's the people she finds most fascinating. They are her passion. They are why she takes on these daring adventures. We want to change the world. Change the world. Change the world. We want to change the world. We want to change the world. Wednesday the 21st. Well, I can now show you the reverse side of camping. I woke this morning at dawn to find a strong wind blowing up clouds from the east. At 7 it began to rain, but I nevertheless started off for the top of Pisgah. I could see from it two of the places from which Balaam is supposed to have attempted the cursing of Israel, and behind me lay the third, Nibanaba in Arabic. The Moses legend is a very touching one. I stood on the top of Pisgah and looked out over the wonderful Jordan Valley and the blue sea, and the barren hills, veiled and beautiful by cloud, and thought it was one of the most pathetic stories I had ever been told. I then rode to Nebo, the cloud sweeping down behind me and swallowing up the whole gore plain. As I left Nebo, it began to stream. Arrived in Madaba about 11.30, wet through. As I rode through the squalid, muddy little streets, to my surprise I was greeted in American by a man in a waterproof. He is a photographer, semi-professional, and his name is Baker, and he is very cheerful and nice. I selected my camping ground on the lee side of the village, and Mr. Baker took me to the Latin monastery where he is lodging to keep out of the wet while my camp is being put up. I sent up to Government House, so to speak, to find out what my Mudir's letter had done for me in the matter of tomorrow's escort. The answer came that this Mudir was away, but that the Effendi was coming to see me. He appeared, a tall, middle-aged Turk. I invited him into my tent with all politeness and offered him cigarettes. You see, a bad habit of mine may have some merits while well, Hannah brought him a cup of coffee. But the soldier was not to be had. There weren't enough. I determined to wait till the coffee and cigarettes had begun to work, and turned the conversation to other matters, 
with as many polite phrases as I could remember. Fortunately, I fell upon photography and found his great desire was to be photographed with his soldiers. I jumped at this and offered to do him and send him copies and so forth, and the upshot of it was that for me he would send a soldier tomorrow at dawn. I think it's rather a triumph to have conducted so successful a piece of diplomacy in Arabic, don't you? The wind has dropped and the sky is clear, but it's cold and dampish. I had the brilliant idea of sending into the town for a brazier which was brought to me full of charcoal and put into my tent. I have been drying my habit over it. From my camp I look over the great rolling plains of cornfields stretching eastwards. Thursday, the 22nd. This has been a most wonderful day. I sent up to know if my soldier was coming. He arrived in a few minutes. A big, handsome, cheerful Circassian, mounted on a strong white horse, and a little before seven we started off. In a dip, we came suddenly upon a great encampment of Christians from Madaba, and stopped to photograph them and their sheep. They were milking them, the sheep being tied head to head in a serried line of perhaps forty at a time. We went on and on, the ground rising and falling and always the same beautiful grass. No road. We went straight across country. Another big encampment of Christians. The people were most friendly and one man insisted on mounting his little mare and coming with us, just for love. So we all cantered off together, through many flocks and past companies of dignified storks, walking about and eating the locusts, till we came to the road, the pilgrim road to Mecca. Road, of course, it is not. It is about one-eighth of a mile wide, and consists of hundreds of parallel tracks trodden out by the immense caravan which passes over it twice a year. We next came to some camps and flocks of the Beni Sakr, the most redoubted of all Arab tribes, and the last of who submitted to the Sultan's rule. Very much not pleasant, said Tarif, and now we were almost at the foot of the low hills, and before us stood the ruins of Mosheta. It is a Persian palace. The beauty of it all was quite past words. It's a thing one will never forget as long as one lives. At last, most reluctantly, we turned back on our four hours ride home. We hadn't gotten more than a few yards before three of the Beni Sakr came riding towards us, armed to the teeth, black-browed and most menacing. When they saw our soldier, they threw us the salam with some disgust, and after a short exchange of politenesses, proceeded on their way. We felt that the interview might have turned differently if we had been unescorted. We rode on straight across the plains putting up several foxes and a little gray wolf. Unfortunately, we did not see the white gazelles of which they are said to be so many, also jackals and hyenas. Just as we came to the edge of the cornfields, again two of the Beni Sakr sprang up seemingly out of the ground and came riding toward us. Exactly the same interview took place as before and they retired in disgust. We got in at five, quite delighted with our day. Don't think I have ever spent such a wonderful day. Friday, the 23rd. Hannah woke me up at 6.30 just in time to see a lovely sun rise across the Madaba Plains. At 7.30 I went up to the Sarai to see if the Effendi wanted to be photographed, but I found him so busy that he had not had the time to get into his swell clothes. So we arranged that it was to be four when I came back. The Effendi insisted on sending a soldier with me to Karak. It is quite unnecessary, but this is the penalty of my distinguished social position, and also, I think, of my nationality, for the Turks are much afraid of us, and he probably thinks I have some project of annexation in my mind. The Circassian for he is again a Circassian, is good-looking and pleasant. They are an agreeable race. I was off at eight. We were on the Roman road all day, paved on the flat, hewn out of the rock in the gorges. Oh, my camp is too lovely tonight. I am in the great field of yellow daisies by the edge of a rushing stream, full of fish and edged with oleanders which are just coming out. I have a bunch of them in my tent. On either side rise the great walls of the valley, and protect me from every breath of wind. I have just been having a swim in the river under the oleander bushes, and Tarif has shot me a partridge for dinner. There is a very pretty white broom flowering. Masala! Oh, the nice sound of water and frogs and a little screaming owl. Sunday, the 25th. I'm going to Petra! Well, with giving out that I'm a German, for they are desperately afraid of the English. I have got permission and a soldier from the governor, and this is always difficult and often impossible and I can't but think that the finger of Providence points southwards. I would telegraph to ask your permission, but there's no telegraph nearer than Jericho. I think a missionary and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Harding, are coming with me. They are nice people, and I shall like to have them. He has gone to see about mules, etc., now, and we are off at dawn. I have spent a pleasant day here. I photographed and came back to my tent determined to penetrate into the southwest fort, which is now used as barracks for the Turkish soldiers. Dr. Johnson had told me I could not possibly get permission, so I asked for none, but took Hannah and walked calmly in, in an affable way, 
greeted all the soldiers politely, and was shown all over. As I was walking about, I came to the edge of a deep pit, and whom should I see at the bottom of it but my poor Madaba friends? It was the prison. There were underground chambers on either side of the pit, but they were all sitting outside to enjoy the sun that straggles down at midday. We greeted each other affectionately. I then went down a long outer stair to a lower floor, so to speak, of the forts, and here again was shown great vaulted rooms cut out of the rock. These are all inhabited by soldiers and mules. I felt I had done a good morning sightseeing, and came back to my tent where I was presently fetched by a little Turkish girl, the daughter of an effendi, who told me her mother was sitting down in the shadow of the wall a little below my camp, and invited me to come and drink coffee. We went down hand in hand, and I found a lot of Turkish women sitting on the ground under a fig tree. So I sat down too and was given coffee, and as they all but one talked Arabic, we had a cheerful conversation. We had a glorious view down the valley and across the Dead Sea. It is supposed to be the tomb of Noah, and honored as such. It was a glorious hot night. We bought a lamb today for Ahmediyeh, which seems cheap. He was a perfect love, and his fate cut me to the heart. I felt if I looked at him any longer, I should be like Byron in the goose, so I parted from him hastily, and there were delicious lamb cutlets for supper. My soldier is, again, a Circassian. His name is Ayub Jab. He appears to possess the complacent disposition of his namesake, but he has little of the Arabic, his native tongue being, of course, Turkish. We have a beautiful flowery place for our camp, and I've been bathing in the stream. The men have shot partridges and caught fish in the most ingenious way. They put a basin weighted with some stones in the stream with a little bread in it, and cover it with a cloth in which there are a few holes. The fish swim in to eat the bread and can't get out. They are very small. My servants are admirable. My own camp goes like clockwork with never a hitch. Hannah is the prop and stay of it all. The two muleteers are also extremely good servants, and we have vowed always to travel together. We heard that we were still six hours away from Wadi Musa. One of the great difficulties of this journey is that no one knows the distances even approximately, and there is no map worth a farthing. Another is that the population is so scant we can't get good food. This is a starvation camp tonight. We have nothing but rice and bread, a little potted meat, no charcoal and no barley for our horses. We have been on the Roman road all day. The men are all in good spirits and we are extremely cheerful. It is a good joke, you know. Break! I was told I could not possibly get permission, so I asked for none. Gertrude summarized herself quite well in those few words. She's sneaking into places she is told not to go. She's brushing off aggressive soldiers like they're buzzing flies. She's even posing as somebody else because the locals aren't fond of the English. Who would have liked the English back then? Good thing for Gertrude that she was fluent in German. Not only is Gertrude plowing through the human obstacles in her path, but she's moving past all the natural ones as well. Hunger and heat can break anyone. I've had a mental breakdown myself the one time I didn't bring enough food into the Sierra Nevada on a backpacking trip. But Gertrude remains in high spirits despite the harsh elements, and sometimes harsh people. I wonder if Gertrude was as well equipped for this journey as she is letting on in these letters to her father. Was she truly this bold, this fascinated? Or is it all just a face she put into her words so that she would not have to worry her father back home in England? From what I know about Gertrude Bell, I believe most of what she says is honest, but who really knows? We read blogs and books today which often only highlight the highs and lows of modern adventures. There is very little of the mental and physical mid-tier struggles that, in reality, take up most of a person's day. Of course we want to share the most interesting elements of our lives with each other, but is that causing people to have higher expectations of their own lives? And with higher expectations, are we developing a growing sense of failure or dread and depression? Maybe we could all benefit from being a little bit more like Gertrude. We could be a bit more involved in our own lives, our own passions. She recounts what she sees to her father, but these are her pursuits. This is her adventure. She's not sitting at home and comparing herself to others. She's venturing out to observe others, to learn from them, engage with them. Gertrude once wrote, All the earth is seamed with roads, and all the sea is furrowed with the tracks of ships, and over all the roads and all the waters a continuous stream of people passes up and down, traveling, as they say, for their pleasure. What is it, I wonder, that they go out to see? And she has also said, I will have no locked cupboards in my life.
regarded ourselves as engineers. We pretended to construct, to assemble our work in the style of a mechanic. Thursday, the 29th, from Wadi Musa. At length we have arrived, and it is worth all the long, long way. We descended to the village of Wadi Musa, where we hoped to get provisions, but devil a hen was there, so we dispatched a man post-haste to the nearest Bedouin camp for a lamb, and as yet, 7 p.m., none has appeared. However, we have got Laban and barley and butter, so we can support life with our own rice and bread. What the people in Wadi Musa live on, I can't imagine. They hadn't so much as milk. These things settled, we rode on and soon got into the entrance of the defile which leads to Petra. The Bab es Sikh is a passage about a half mile long and in places not more than eight feet wide. The rocks rise on either side straight up a hundred feet or so. They are sandstone of the most exquisite red and sometimes almost arch overhead. The stream runs between, filling all the path, though it used to flow through conduits and the road was paved. Oleanders grew along the stream and here and there a sheaf of ivy hung down over the red rock. We went on in ecstasies until suddenly, between the narrow openings of the rocks, we saw the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. Imagine a temple cut out of the solid rock, the charming facades supported on the great Corinthian column standing clear, soaring upwards to the very top of the cliff in the most exquisite proportions, and carved with groups of figures almost as fresh as when the chisel left them all this in the rose-red rock, with the sun just touching it and making it look almost transparent. As we went on, the gorge widened. On either side of the cliffs were cut into the rock tombs of every shape and adorned in every manner, some standing, columned, in the rock, some clear with a pointed roof, some elaborate, some simple, some capped with pointed pyramids, many adorned with the curious form of a stair high up over the doorway. The gorge opened and brought us out into a kind of square between the cliffs, with a rude cut theater in it and tombs on every side. We went on and got into a great open place, the cliffs widening out far on every side and leaving this kind of amphitheater strewn over with mounds of ruins. And here we camped, under a row of the most elaborate tombs, three stories of pillars and cornices, and the whole topped by a great funeral urn. It is like a fairy tale city, all pink and wonderful. The great paved roads stretch up to a ruined ark and vanish. A solid wall springs up some six feet. A rose-red city half as old as time. I wish the lamb had come. Friday the 30th. I have had a busy day. An hour before dawn, Ayub and I started riding off with a shepherd to guide us to the top of Mount Hot. You realize that no daughter of yours could be content to sit quietly at the bottom of a mountain when there is one handy. We rode up nearly to the top and then dismounted and climbed to the highest summit on which stands, whose tomb would you think? Aaron's. I have never seen anything like these gorges. The cliffs rise over a thousand feet on either side, broken into the most incredible shapes and colored, red, yellow, blue, white. Great patterns over them, more lovely than any mosaic. I came back to my tents and found that we had bought 50 eggs, some figs, and a sheep. But unfortunately, the sheep has grown rather old in his long journey to us. Saturday, the 31st. We left Petra at 7 this morning with great regret. It was looking too exquisite, and I longed for another day, but the Hardings were bound to be back. Sunday, April 1st. We were off at 7 this morning, and rode two and a half hours along our former road across the wide, stretching uplands. The monotony was broken by keeping a watch for the Roman milestones. We were going very slowly so as to keep in touch with the mules, and we passed one every quarter of an hour the whole way. The paved road was often very well preserved. It was blazing hot. We lunched at the opening of the usual broad shallow valley, where there was a very dirty pool at which the mules watered, and one tiny thorn bush under the shade of which we tried to sit, but, as it was one foot, there was not much shade to be had. In all this country there is practically no water. There are a few cisterns scattered over the hills and, I should think, emptied before the middle of the summer, and where we are camping a couple of wells, and that's absolutely all. I nearly went to sleep on my horse this morning, but was wakened up by hearing Ayub relating to me tales of Ibn Rashid. One gets so accustomed to it all that one ceases to be bored. We set off again at twelve and Ayub sighted some Arabs on top of a hill, so he and I and Hannah and Tarif left the others and rode up over the hill and found a lot of Arabs watering their flocks at a bit. That's a cistern. It was a very pretty sight. They brought the water up in skins and poured it into the stone troughs all around, and the sheep and goats drank thirstily. We followed the Roman road, which runs straight over the top of the hills, our camping place down in the valley at 2.30. It is called Tawaneh, 
and was once a big town. The ruins of it stretch up on either side of the valley, but there is nothing now but a cluster of black tents a few hundred yards below us. I pay to call on some Arab ladies and watch them making a sort of sour cream cheese in a cauldron over the fire. They gave me some when it was done, we ate it all with our fingers, and then they made me coffee, and we drank it up out of the same cup, and it was quite good. It was very difficult to understand them, for their vocabulary is perfectly different from mine. However, we got along by keeping to simple subjects. These people are gypsies. Some of them have just been dancing for me, round my campfire. It was quite dark, with a tiny new moon. The fire of dry thorns flickered up faded and flickered again, and showed the circle of men crouching on the ground, their black and white cloaks wrapped around them and the women in the middle dancing. She looked as though she had stepped out of an Egyptian fresco. She wore a long red gown bound around her waist with a dark blue cloth, and falling open in front to show a redder petticoat below. Round her forehead was another dark blue cloth, bound tightly and falling in long ends down her back. Her chin was covered by a white cloth drawn up round her ears and falling in folds to her waist, and her lower lips tattooed with indigo. Her feet, in red leather shoes, scarcely moved, but all her body danced, and she swept a red handkerchief she held in one hand, round her head, and clasped her hands together in front of her impassive face. The men played a drum and a discordant fife, and sang a monotonous song and clapped their hands, and gradually she came nearer and nearer to me, twisting her slender body till she dropped down on the heap of brushwood at my feet, and kneeling, her body still danced, and her arms swayed and twisted round the mask-like face. She got up and retreated again slowly, with downcast eyes, invoking blessings upon me at intervals, till at last I called her and gave her a couple of beskills. Near Damascus is their home and they are going back there from Mecca when they have been near the prophet, thanks be to God, and they have seen the holy city, God made it, and they hope to reach Damascus in safety, if God please. They talked Arabic to me, but to each other, the gypsy tongue, which sounded more like Turkish than anything else. Monday the 2nd. We left this morning at 7. It was very hot, a strong baking wind from the south and a heavy hot mist, most unpleasant. Through this we rode for two hours or more straight up on one side of the valley. The morning's amusement was again the milestones which are wonderfully well preserved, many of them still standing upright in groups of three or four. I have counted as many as eight in one place. I don't know why this is, unless every succeeding emperor who mended the road put up a few milestones of his own. The inscriptions are always visible, but would generally be very difficult to decipher, the letters being much worn. Besides which, a mess of Arab tribe marks have been cut on top of them. Many of them, however, have been read by the learned. We went to a tiny village called Aine where there is a lovely spring and a water mill. We were still six hours from Karak, and Ali was black in the face from heat, so that I thought he was going to have sunstroke. The Hardings were obliged to go on, but I decided to stay here. They have been very nice. My camp is pitched halfway up the hill, with the head of the spring at my door and in front. Deep cornfields where the barley is standing in ear and the storks walking solemnly up to their necks in green. There has been an immense flock of them flying and settling on the hillside and when I took a stroll I soon found what was engaging the attention of the father of luck. The ground was hopping with locusts. On some of the slopes they have eaten every leaf and they are making their way down to the corn. I have just been watching my people make bread. Flour was fortunately to be got from the mill below us. They set two logs alight, and when they had got enough ashes they made an immense cake, two feet across and a half inch thick, of flour and water and covered it with hot ashes. After a quarter of an hour it had to be turned and recovered, and the result is most delicious eaten hot. It becomes rather wooden when it's cold. The flour is very coarse, almost like oatmeal. These are the moments when my camp is at its best. Half a dozen of ragged onlookers were sitting around in the circle of flickering light and a tiny moon overhead. One of my muleteers, Muhammad, is a Druze. If all his sect are like him, they must be a charming race. He is a great big handsome creature, gentle and quiet and extremely abstemious. He eats nothing but rice and bread and figs. It makes me the more keen to go to Horan, which is the chief center of them, and I want to very much take my two muleteers with me. They are very capable and obliging, and Muhammad would be interesting to have in Drew's country. One mayn't know or see anything of their religious observances, but he has been telling me a great deal about their life and customs. He says nearly all the people in the Lebanon are Druze. He himself comes from Beirut, where he lives next door to Ali. They both talk with a pretty, soft, sing-song accent of the Lebanon. I have a good variety of accents with me, for Tarif has the Bedouin and Hannah the real cockney of Jerusalem. They appeal to me sometimes to know which is right. I never was so sunburnt in my life. I am a rich red-brown, not at all becoming, in spite of the quangle-wangle hat you sent me.
That's it for this journey. But the adventure was far from over for Gertrude. She went on to Damascus next, and then around the world several times after that before taking on a more political role in the Middle East, where she went on to essentially bring a king to power and drew a nation's borders. There is so much more that I could go on with. Gertrude Bell is a person worth remembering. If you want to read more about Gertrude, pay a visit to BetterHiker.com, where we put together an adventurer profile which outlines her accomplishments and adventures. If you like this show, please, please take a minute of your time to rate the Better Hiker podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps people find this show, and it'll put a smile on my face as I read every review. Thanks, everyone. Better yourselves in the trails you walk. Be a better hiker. See you next time. That's it for this episode of the Better Hiker podcast. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to Better Hiker on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. For more info and content, check out our website at betterhiker.com. To contribute to the show and receive some extra goodies, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash betterhiker. Thanks for listening.